Well, good morning, friends, and welcome to another episode of Grounded, a new video cast with Revive Our Hearts. We're meeting every morning at 9 a.m. Eastern Time Live just to encourage one another during this very difficult global crisis. Uh, that's my friend Dana Gresh. She forgot to introduce herself. But oh, you need to know my introduction. Aaron. We're old friends. No, and I'm Aaron not. Davis. Although I hope some of you, uh, this is our second week of Grounded. I hope many of you are new to the fold. We're now on Facebook this morning, and we hope there's some new faces here this morning. Uh, we're your hosts uh, for this daily dose of hope and perspective. And what's been amazing to us is that women around the globe are gathering here in this virtual space every morning so that we can hold on to God's word together. Um, if you want to join us every morning, and I hope that you do, you can subscribe to the Revive Our Hearts YouTube channel. That way you'll be notified whenever we're broadcasting. Uh, but like I said, we've got some new friends joining us via Facebook Live this morning. Welcome. We are so glad you're here. We would love it if you would share the live right now, um, because we know there are women everywhere who need, like I do, to start our mornings fixed, uh, with our eyes fixed on Jesus. So um, today we'll be focusing on the topic of prayer, and the needs can feel truly overwhelming. Um, I took a prayer walk yesterday around my home, and I just kept repeating the same prayers over and over because it was a little bit hard for me to know how to pray. So through his word and by the power of his Holy Spirit, how is God calling his people to pray in these days? That's what we'll be talking about this morning. You know, Aaron, I'm so glad that we are. Um, I bet that it was hard to know how to pray over the weekend. You told us Friday that your sweet baby boy, Ezzy, was being um, in the hospital, not in the hospital, he went to a triage tent to see if he had coronavirus because he was having respiratory trouble. What was the outcome? And can you update on us on how he is doing um, this morning? Well, so many sweet grounded viewers reached out to me and said they were praying and that is so powerful. And when I, as a mom, had prayer paralysis, you all were praying for my family and for my sweet boy. And so he is doing better. We were doing breathing treatments every few hours there for a while. A lot of wheezing, that kind of scary breathing that you don't ever want to see your baby do. But now we're just doing breathing treatments as needed. We're on a good antibiotic and um, he's smiling and silly. So the Lord's been kind to us in that for sure. And we know that this um, crisis is hitting home for you in many different ways. Um, for us, just the reality of having to go through that triage tent experience brought it to a, a new level of real for us. And we continue to hear and see very difficult stories around the globe. Um, yesterday, of course, President Trump gave a speech extending those social distancing guidelines until the end of April. And I don't know about you, but that felt like a gut punch to me. April 30th feels really far off. Uh, my 40th birthday is actually April 29th, and I was, I was hoping to be celebrating with friends that big birthday, and I won't be. So now, more than ever, it seems like we need good news. And so every morning here on Grounded, we take just a minute and share some good news. Psalm 62, 8, the psalmist declared, trust in him at all times. That word all takes on some new meaning for us right now. Oh, people, pour out your heart before God, for he's a refuge for us. And that's always true. We can always trust him. He's always good. And part of the reason we gather together like this every morning is just to remind each other to pray and to um, spur each other on towards righteousness and good deeds and to think about the good. So here's a comment from Joelle. Joelle says, I've been so blessed this week by the program Grounded. It's been so wonderful to see their joy in God, to hear his word and read and be thankful together. It's reminded me that I need to take my eyes off of my struggles and pray more for those around the world. So that's part of why we gather here this morning. Dana, Give us some good news today. I would love to do that, Erin. You know, um, I scroll the news feed every morning. I just Google coronavirus and see what comes up. Yeah. And the fourth or fifth article that came up today was an op-ed piece on a major news outlet, and it was all about God. And I'm, I'm seeing this more and more. Let me read a few words to you from this 
piece on Fox News. The current human death rate is 100%. Mm. This is not me saying this. This is a op-ed piece in Fox News. Coronavirus or not, nobody gets out of here without dying. We hope and pray and believe they'll solve this current pandemic. We hope you'll live a great long life, but God sometimes calls people home early or not. It's different from our schedule. He's the boss, we're not. Right there, the gospel. It is, he's reminding us that God is in control, we are not, God is God, we are not. And that's, that's a good thing for us to remember all the time, but that's something that's being illuminated right now and the media is talking about it. That's good news. I thought that yesterday during Trump's speech, when he said this statement, he said, death is the enemy here. And I thought, well, did I just hear the gospel being proclaimed on the White House ground? Because that is part of the gospel. Of course, Jesus brings life. Uh, That is the good news in that. But I, too, am hearing the gospel declared in places that I've never heard it declared before. And that's good news for celebrating. Ladies, what good news are you seeing in your community? What good news are you seeing in your scroll feed? We'd love to hear from you. So go ahead and tell us in the comments. And um, maybe tomorrow, your good news will be the news we share with everyone. Mm, Love that. So it's time to get grounded with God's people, which I'm so excited about today. (laughs) I am excited too. I feel like God has really appointed this guest for us. I've been excited about some of the things I've been hearing him say, participated in um, a a Zoom meeting with him on Saturday morning with people from all across the continent. And during this time when we're separated from our church families, Bible study groups, things like that, we are finding that we're needing each other more than ever and we're connected in a unique way more than ever. Um, And so this morning, our guest is a man who has been praying for God to revive this land and who is connecting people that are motivated to pray. His name is Byron Paulus. He's the executive. He is the executive. That's a big word for a blonde someday. He's the executive director of Life Action Ministries, which is the parent organization of Revive Our Hearts. Byron, welcome this morning. I am so delighted, and I just love listening to the two of you interact on eternal things. Thank you. You you are our first gentleman on the program, so you are, you know, you are creating a new territory. You're blazing new ground for us. Um, Byron, we want to talk to you this morning a little bit about how to pray, and there's times that I felt really overwhelmed about how to pray, and you're kind of leading people globally in how to do that. What encouragement can you give to us and what are you seeing happening right now? Well, you know, I think one of the things that all of us need to be praying is with a compassionate heart, first of all, to all those individuals that are hurting the medical community and uh, the list goes on and on, uh, academia and all that they're facing and marketplace, et cetera. But I think even more important than that, you talked about an op-ed in the Fox News and the Wall Street Journal had an op-ed with this title. Uh, 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 What is it, OVID-19, an OVID-19 spiritual awakening question mark. And I'm sitting here saying, these secular news outlets are talking about a spiritual awakening and great awakening. And you know, that's been my heart all these years so i think as we pray for the compassionate areas the most compassionate thing we can pray for is for god to move in another spiritual awakening Mm -hmm. and uh, i'm just i'm just so so excited about how god these past two decades maybe beginning with jim cimbala and fresh wind and fresh power begin to grow the prayer movements here throughout our nation But then all of a sudden, as is proven throughout history, there are things that God allows at least to take place that cause them to explode on the scene. And that's exactly what's happening right now. The prayer movements across this nation are just blossoming. They're flourishing. They're expanding. And I I can be more excited. I mean, I could go on and on about the number of prayer movements right now, Dana. You, you, um, you have you host a prayer call for revival yeah. w- weekly i think um tell us a little bit about that and have you seen any growth as far as people responding to that need 
you know, it's kind of interesting. And yes, I uh, have seen growth. Uh, one cry is something that God put in my heart 10 years ago this weekend to share with people for the first time. And it's a, it's a simply a call for nationwide spiritual awakening. It's a national call for awakening. And so 10 years ago, we began a Tuesday evening, eight o'clock PM prayer call. And all this deck for a decade now, some 20 individuals, I mean, if you listen to it, they would just cry out to God. But two weeks ago, we decided to expand it to Tuesday and Thursday and Saturday evenings at eight o'clock. And all of a sudden there's like 500 people crying out to the Lord. And I'm just, I'm getting on there and I'm just being blown away by the leaders that are actually the prayer leaders for this uh, gathering on Tuesday, Thursday, and, and Saturday. And they are leading the nation in prayer. People who have been intercessors, this kind of reminds me of the 1857, Jeremiah Lampier. He started and a few more and a few more. And as you know, there's a crisis that hit, economic crisis on Wall Street. And all of a sudden it exploded, literally, to where there were not enough public buildings in New York City to hold everybody that wanted to pray. So I just want to say this, what if there's not enough internet bandwidth <laughs> here in the near future to hold everybody that wants to pray online? Wow, what a beautiful thought. Um, I hope that as you're hearing Byron, your heart's stirring the way that mine is, because <laughs> This is something that I have a desire for so much. I've prayed to see revival. Byron, I don't think it's a mistake that it's an anniversary date of when you started this prayer mm -hmm. call. Um, can you tell us what things are you seeing happening right now? As a man who studied revival, mm. what things are happening right now that are the ingredients that are poising us for revival that would encourage us to press into this prayer movement? I'm so grateful for that question. I was laying awake this morning thinking about that very thing. And there's a phenomena happening that uh, isn't new. It's historic, but it's also very biblical. And in Hosea 10, verse 12, Hosea had a very big crisis for them. He cried out, it is time to seek the Lord until he comes and reigns righteousness. And it's not until he comes and delivers us from our economic dilemma. It's not till he comes and delivers us from our, our um, uh, even our health and some of those other entertainment and all these things that we want to resurrect. God has something else in mind. He wants to come. And I think that's what I'm beginning to slowly see happening. People are praying. So in all the growth of the prayer movement, something unique started happening several years ago. And, and whether it's the National Prayer Committee, the National Day of Prayer, the Collegiate Day of Prayer just last month with 4,944 every campus adopted. But here's what's unique. And it goes back to Jonathan Edwards. There are two things that are happening. There is explicit agreement as to what to pray for, spiritual awakening, revival and spiritual awakening. And secondly, there's visible union. And that was the title of Jonathan Edwards' book, A Humble Attempt for Explicit Agreement and Visible Union for the re uh, Revival of Religion and the Advancement of the Kingdom. And so right now, there is this unbelievable union, oneness taking place among Christian leaders, among the people of God. And you know, could that really happen apart from technology? And um, I don't think it could. Now, if I could just comment, I know this is a conversation, and uh, Aaron, uh, I've just... Obviously, this is on my heart. But here's something I don't think people realize historically. In the 18, there's a Time Magazine article where the headlines of the Time Magazine rather said, America, 1848. And you start reading it and it, you feel like it's talking about today because all the advancement of technology, the telegraph was invented and they were concerned about romantic relationships starting up on the telegraph, like the internet today, right? And uh, then, but uh, they were able to do photography at 20 times the speed. They were able to uh, print at 20 times the speed. The railroad was completed to what is now Silicon Valley. So the mail system changed. Communication for 10 years before 1857, the foundation was set. And that's like Zoom, where Zoom started 10 years ago. And then God used that communication to spread the word of what he was doing in Fulton Street around the world. Oh. 
Okay, what is that's my computer out there. Your computer. Oh, I'm so, so sorry. You're on a live program. I'm on a live program and I don't even know how to straighten that out. Where's my tech guys at the office? They're usually sitting next to me. Okay, we're back on, right? We're, we're good, we're good. Okay. So anyway, um, I just wanted to say today, the stage is set for God to just move through technology as we're experiencing right now. Thank you. That excites me, Byron. And as you were just mentioning, you know, we need, our hunger needs to be for God, not for the stock market to change. Right. And I hope the Lord intervenes with this terrible plague that's hitting us. But our first cry can't be that. Our first cry has to be for the healing of our hearts, the plague of our hearts. Because right. yeah. I think that is much more lethal. And um, this morning I was actually soaking in the verse that Aaron mentioned earlier, the chapter, Psalm 62. And it says, for God alone my soul waits in silence. And it says that several times for God alone. Mm -hmm. And that was my prayer this morning. Lord, make me hungry for you alone, mm -hmm. not for the things of this world. Mm -hmm. Let me trust mm -hmm. those to you. Let me entrust those to you. And let me be hungry for you. Would you pray mm -hmm. for us, Byron? Pray for women all across the globe who are joining us right now. Some of them in epicenters of this plague in having really painful, frightening days, mm -hmm. but pray that all of us yeah. would want God alone to be the cry of our heart. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Lord, these ladies that are gathering here this morning, we all, every one of us, desperately need you. And in social distancing, God, I'm so grateful for that verse in James, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. There's no social distancing with you. And the greatest need of our heart is simply that, that we would draw close to you during these moments when the opportunity, when the desperation, when the need is so evident for all of us. God, please don't let this moment pass in the history of the world without repentance and revival of our individual hearts. And so God, I think of that one verse in Isaiah chapter 64, I think it is in verse three, when you did awesome things, which we looked not for, you came down. Mm -hmm. And we weren't looking for this and we wouldn't call it awesome. But if you move in all of our hearts across this nation as your children, God, it will end up being something so awesome. And the most compassionate prayer we can have is for you to come in great power and for people to be swept into a relationship with you, into the kingdom, and many come to know you personally. Thank you, God, for what you're going to do by faith. I pray in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, the great reviver. Amen and amen. Amen. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Byron, for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. Well, I'm encouraged, you know, I, I, I can go through hard things, especially when I have the perspective that God is using this. And I think we're all on a bit on the edge of our seats because we have this sense that God is, of course, going to use this. And I'm encouraged to pray, uh, to push through a bit of that par prayer paralysis and to ask the Lord for revival. Uh, one of the things we love about these 30 minutes we spend together each morning is that you're watching and you're praying for each other and you're telling us how God is moving where you live. Um, Karen is in South Africa. She wrote to us this morning and said, in South Africa, a national time of prayer was called last Friday. First time in history that I know of, she said of, and we don't even have a Christian government. Amen. Isn't that- Amen. Hello, Karen. I actually know her. She was part of our um, our Revive event that we had in South Africa about a year ago. Hello, friend. And I'm so excited to hear about that prayer movement in South Africa, all We're across the globe. The world, governments, peoples, neighborhoods, families, praying like we've never prayed before. Uh, and we know from scripture that when we pray, the Lord hears us, he responds, he loves us. So that is a source of tremendous hope for me this morning. Alice wrote to us uh, last week and said, this time has been a blessing time. I love that, a blessing time. It gives me strength to pray with you and to share these feelings of fear at the same time we trust our God and our, our faith is bigger, our faith in God is bigger than our fear. And I, there is something that shores us up about praying for each other 
praying with each other, knowing that people around the world are praying, seeking the Lord together. So I'll be thinking about, about what Byron said um, all day and beyond that, so encouraged. Well, it's time for you to grab your Bibles. Every morning, my Bible's handy. I hope that you keep your Bible handy as you watch Grounded each morning because every morning we take some time and we dig into God's Word together. We get grounded in God's Word. And today, where I'd like us to park is in Psalm 13. And just as a preamble, uh, Psalm 13 is a prayer of lament and or despair. And um, you'll hear it when I read it to you here together. And in these days, I am so grateful that prayers of lament and despair are preserved in Scripture. There are lots of prayers in Scripture that have a very different tone from the one that we're going to read together this morning. But I'm so grateful that there's, uh, Dana, I know that you love and have recently written about the book of Habakkuk. Yeah. Habakkuk is full of so, some lamenting prayers, am I right? Yeah, and questions. I think as we look at the laments of Scripture, we're reminded that it's okay to bring God our questions and our doubts and our fears, and we don't have to pray pretty little Christian prayers. We can pour our hearts out to Him. That's what a lament teaches us to do. Yeah, the book of Job is a book that I, I think in times of plenty, we maybe collectively avoid. It feels a little bit contagious because Job's suffering was so severe, but I have a hunch that many of us are parked in the book of Job in these days. And while Job was a righteous man who never cursed God, he chose to be faithful to God. If you really read the prayers of Job in that book, there's some lament, there's deep discouragement, there's despair, and he brings all of that to the Lord. Even as a righteous man trusting the Lord, his prayers are not sanitized. You know, we know that he was covered in sores. And so I imagine him, you know, sitting in the dirt. Scripture tells us he would scratch at those sores with pottery. You know, this is ugly stuff. And yet he's crying out to the Lord in all of that. And I'm just so grateful that those prayers are preserved in Scripture and that they're not pretty. And, you know, I find that I need a prayer language in these days. Romans tells us that none of us really know how to pray. And that we're grateful that we have the Holy Spirit who intercedes for us in a language that's too deep for words. But I really don't know how to pray right now. There are so many prayers. And so I need a prayer language. And that's what these prayers of lament are giving me in these times. So Psalm uh, 13 is one such prayer. Uh, I I messaged back and forth with Nancy DeMoss Wolgamuth and said, would you call this a prayer of lament? I want to make sure that it is. And she said, Yes, she would. She sees lament there. And she said, don't all children of God lament over what brokenness does in our lives and in our world. And so we do lament is appropriate. I'm going to read us all of Psalm 13. It's just six little verses. Uh, and I want you to pay attention for the pivot because there's a pivot that happens in the Psalm that is so important for us. So I'm going to read us all of Psalm 113. I hope right where you are, you're looking at it with us. The psalmist says, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? And as Trump reminded us yesterday, President Trump reminded us yesterday, the enemy here is death. Consider and answer me. O oh Lord, my God, light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. And I got to confess, there are moments in this that I would pray like David. I am shaken, mm. but I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully for me. And that pivot, of course, comes at verse five. David here is being honest. He's saying, it feels like you're not listening, Lord. And he starts with how long? And that is a cry, I think, of so many of our hearts. How long? How long is this going to last? How long until the virus reaches its peak? 
How long until the economy can go back to normal? How long until I can go back to work? How long until I feel safe again? And that's where, that's the heart posture that David starts with. How long? And then he kind of laments, it feels like you've forgotten me, Lord. It feels like this enemy, whoever enemy David was referring to, we can apply to us. It feels like this threat that's coming at us. It feels like the threat's going to win. And he felt shaken. I think that, that, you know, in the Psalm 62 that I read this morning, the first time it says, for God alone, my soul waits. It says, I shall not be greatly shaken. It doesn't say I won't be shaken. I won't be greatly shaken. And this Psalm of lament that you're reading says he is shaken. He is. um, I, I'm reminded of my friend Janet taught me how to keep my fig leaf, fiddle leaf fig alive. Oh, I and killed one. Yeah. Okay. Aaron, give me a, give me a, it's good. <laughs> but she taught me that one of the reasons that many of us don't have success with them is because they were grown to live or they were made to live in a tropical area mm. where wind storms and thunderstorms and tropical rain shakes them regularly. Hmm. That shaking allows them to be rooted and grounded. Love it. (laughs) (laughs) And so, um, you know, we will not be greatly shaken. It doesn't say we won't be shaken. And when we are shaken, there can be purpose in that. I don't know about you, but I think early on I felt some sense of guilt because I was shaken. Hmm. And I do trust the Lord. I do have hope in his word. I do know that a day is coming when all of this will fade away, but I'm shaken. And I find so much hope in David's words because that's what he's saying. He's saying, I've been shaken, but I will choose. I have trusted in your steadfast love. He's looking back and he's going, okay, you've been faithful in the past. You're going to be faithful moving forward. And I'm going to put my hope in that, a stake in the ground there. And then he says, I will sing to the Lord. We're working on a future show about singing because God's people are to be singing people. And though David lays it all out before the Lord, he lays the heartache, the fear, the shaking. He says, I'm going to sing. I'm going to sing to you. I'm going to choose to worship. So Psalm 13 is my prayer language for today. And it can be your prayer language too. Even as we're praying collectively for the globe and for God to revive us, we can use our language and saying. Lord, we're afraid the enemy is coming at us, but we will trust in your steadfast love and help those who have never trusted in your steadfast love before to trust in your steadfast love today. So let's hold on to Psalm 13 together. Aaron, thank you for that little dive, a little scriptural snack today. Um, It's time for our thank you coronavirus segment. And I feel compelled just to say we're praying. We're praying more. We're praying more desperately. We're praying more fervently. So thank you, coronavirus. Yeah. If you have something you're thankful for and grateful for that's coming out as a result of this crisis, let's not fail to count those things up. James 1 says, when you fall into various troubles, count it joy. I think what he's saying there is count the reasons, write them down, make a list of Mm. all the reasons why this crisis, this pain is fruitful in your life. Mm. And that for me today is prayer. Yeah, love that. Well, every day we wanna put some tools in your hand to help you stay grounded in God's word as you live out this mission to be salt and light in a world that seems really dark right now. So we've got a couple of specific tools we would like you to pay attention to today. Um, very, I'm very excited. I lost my script for a moment. That's all right. I, I, the, here's the thing. I am not a technical genius. In fact, I'm quite the technical inept person. And so every day on here, I have to pray just that the Lord will allow my notes and everything to be where they're supposed to be. And they, when they're not, yeah. I'm just going to tell you. Also, my hair color is almost out, Erin. Uh-oh. I think it looks great. I'm feeling it. But you know what? It's a petty thing. One of our readers wrote, she, the Lord's helping her to not pray for petty things anymore. So mm-hmm. I'm not going to pray about my hair, but you might see me go gray. Today's <laughs> Revive Our Hearts program tells the story of the stock market crash of 1857. You heard Byron talking about some of that. Um, this is just a wonderful program. I've heard the, 
the beginning of it. It's riveting. And it, as Byron said today, it's as if when Nancy's talking about this crisis in 1857, it's exactly what we're experiencing right now. You do not want to miss Revive Our Hearts today. Hear it on your local station. If you're in the United States, go to reviveourhearts.com or download it on your phone. Download the app on your phone. You can listen to it there. Mm, I take such comfort in knowing that the Lord saw this moment in history at the foundations of the earth. He knew it was coming. It may have shaken and jarred us, but he didn't. And so when we hear about his faithfulness in the past, it so strengthens my heart because the greatest indicator of who God's going to be is who God's been. And yeah. as you hear about this stock market crash in, 18, in the 1850s, you'll be encouraged because God was faithful. There's also a PDF of a seven-day steadfast prayer guide uh, that we wanted to point you to. It's on our Leader Connection blog today. That is a blog for leaders, uh, but there is good stuff there for all of us. And aren't we all leading in some sphere? Um, so we'll post the link for these resources, but that includes um, some prompts for how to pray steadfastly uh, in the days ahead. And we wanted to get that to you so that if, like me, you sometimes get some prayer paralysis, you can use that as a guide and keep praying. Keep praying and join us right here every day, 9 a.m. Eastern time, live on YouTube. Also now joining you by Facebook. We would love to remind you each day to pray, to be in God's word, be grounded in his word, be grounded in community. Um, tomorrow's program I'm very, very excited about because we have a very special guest. Her name is Susan Hunt. She's been a speaker at various Revive or True Woman events. So some of you may be familiar with her. She's a grandmother in the faith. And she's going to root us in God's word together tomorrow. She's going to give us a grandmother's perspective on COVID-19. Erin, we've been doing a live every day on YouTube at noon for True Girl. And a lot of the 8 to 12-year-old girls that are joining us are fearful for their grandparents, which mm -hmm. I love. And we're teaching them to take that fear to God in prayer. But she's going to be joining us tomorrow to speak to us as a grandma about how we should pray for them. I have that same fear. Our grandma is 90, Mimi. We love her. We can't be with her. Uh, and But she's an encouragement to us every day over the phone. And I know Susan is going to be a great encouragement to us tomorrow. So as we move from this place, let's commit to pray for each other. Let's commit to pray, asking God to show mercy and stop the spread of this virus, but also that he would send revival. So let's wake up with hope together tomorrow morning on Grounded.